Hello and welcome to this World Values Day conversation series. I'm Anna McAfee and today or tonight, uh, wherever you're watching from, I'm delighted to welcome Sarah Wilson, who is an author, podcaster, climate educator um, and climate activist. Thank you for agreeing to this, Sarah. Oh, that's wonderful to be talking to. Well, I don't know where everybody is in the world, but I'm here in Paris in a very small apartment. So um yeah, and it's, I think it's, what is it, midday, so it's around about lunchtime. Yes, and I'm in Australia, but I do know we have a lot of people, probably US, UK uh, related, perhaps not US live now, but um, but a lot of people very interested um, in your work, Sarah, and, um, and I'm very excited to pick your brain about values um, because I think... Of all the of all the people I could pick, whom I followed online for a few years, I think you would be possibly one of the most values driven. So, um, so thank you, thank you once again. One question I love to ask everyone um, as part of this series is: Could you share one of your values with us? You can pick an obvious one, um, mm. or perhaps one that people wouldn't necessarily associate with you. What what is the value? Where did it come from? And how do you put it into practice? Okay, I guess the first one that comes to mind is an obvious one and it's it's just caring. And if I can use kind of slightly vulgar language, um, it's not too vulgar just to, to warn you, um, I have a sort of a hashtag that's associated with me and it's called give a shit. And, um, you know, when I was working at I Quit Sugar, I used to say to my team, do we give a shit about this? Is this what we give a shit about, you know? And sorry, it's a very Australian uh, term, but... Um, it's one that's become associated with the way that I do things and it's kind of almost the, the, the way that I make decisions is, is do we give a shit about this? And I think that is something that has guided me all of my life. Like I, I remember walking along with my brother and he was talking about, we were talking about care and, you know, it's like at what point do you say um, I care about this but I'm no longer going to care about that? you know, and there's that line, isn't there, where we've got to work out. And I work to the, I work to the idea that I actually want to care about absolutely everything. Um, you know, I don't want to actually draw the line at my immediate family. Um, now, we only have a certain amount of energy for doing that in a lifetime. Um, and I suppose I've made a lot of decisions that have enabled me to expand that circle of care so I don't have children and that was a decision I made. I don't have a partner. I don't live with material possessions. I, I live out of one suitcase of belongings. Um, I've given away a lot of my money and what that's done is enabled me to free myself up to care about a bigger circle of influence um, because that is just how I operate. And it's not so much that I do it because I should or I'm working to a particular moral code. It really is my galvanising and motivating principle. Um, so, yeah, my, that conversation with my brother was quite telling because I was like, well, where do you draw the line? And I, I can't draw the line at not picking up rubbish or not helping out a stranger if I see them crying, you know, next to me. Um, if, if you feel motivated to care, I, I kind of, I personally feel I want to go into that space. So, yeah, um, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but it's my most honest answer that I can think of right now. Oh, I think it does. Care, care is a really wonderful value, actually, and goes hand in hand with many. So, um, mm. so thank you for that and for that insight as well. You mentioned I Quit Sugar there, um, and whilst it's probably not very relevant, I think, at least from my perspective, it is something very telling, um, your experience with, um, for those that uh, probably aren't familiar, um, probably when I started following you, you were running I Quit Sugar, and um, it was a business that you was very successful, which you just shut, gave most of it to charity, um, moved into looking really, that moved into food waste, which moved into climate. And I think 
all of the decisions that you have made throughout your career or even life have been very values driven. What I want to ask you is how have you personally built that courage to take the action that you take from really getting behind causes that you so value and um, really see, you know, there's been many recently, um, but where does that courage come from and how have you built it? Mm. Well, I think it's got a little bit to do with the fact that I'm quite old. I'm, I'm 50, you know, and I think it is harder when you're younger to stand in the arena. The great thing about getting older as a woman is your estrogen drops off as you approach menopause. And honestly, you start to get a very clear perspective on where you want to put your energy, right? Because there's so much less of it. Um, Jane Fonda, I think, said it once, you know, your estrogen drops off and basically you have and less, let's call them, um, uh, she used an expletive, but less things you, you care about, um, care less about the things that don't matter and you care more about the things that do matter, put it that way. Anyway, um, I, I think that's got a little bit to do with it. I started out as a journalist. I was a political columnist at a very young age. I was the youngest in the Murdoch kind of stable at the time. I was 23. And so I would get trolls and feedback, but it was handwritten. So it was very limited, you know. So I got used to sort of that kind of thing in a very old school way. And as I moved into editing Cosmopolitan, being the public eye, you know, being written about in gossip pages, I sort of was a little bit older and I got more and more used to that kind of thing. And, of course, as, you know, technology arrived, I was quite well versed in in handling it and having a mindset for it. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's that phrase, um, I think it was Roosevelt who said, you know, um, about being the, the man, the person in the arena rather than, you know, standing outside and, you know, throwing insults from, from the bleachers. Um, you know, I really do think it's important to be the person in the arena. Who is going to do it if you don't is sort of my motto. Um, and I do understand that that's not for everybody. Um, I personally struggle to understand how if you care about something how you can't just not want to to go forth and 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 say what needs to be said if 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 it's of service i guess i was like it as a child and i like i i remember um i i was not very popular i was in a very small country school i was bullied for being intense um and kind of also being skinny and from being being from a family that was quite poor um but I remember, you know, if somebody else was being bullied and there was an injustice, um, when the teacher came round or the principal came round to go, what's going on here? I would put up my hand and say, this is what happened. And, of course, then I'd cop it, you know, even though I had nothing to do with it. Um, at the time, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't implicated in the original issue. But, um, yeah, there's, there's the piece of advice that I share in one of my books, First We Make the Beast Beautiful, about making really difficult decisions, which I think is similar to going and putting yourself out there on a limb, you know, and mm -hmm. and standing up for things. Um, it's it, it, There was this sort of psychologist I used to see when I was editing Cosmo. I really needed somebody to keep me on track at the time. And um, I was making the decision to leave the magazine because I developed this illness, which became very debilitating. And you know, I was like, I needed to jump. And she said to me, darling, when you jump from a great height, you, you invariably do land in a better place because this incredible growth process happens in the process of jumping. And she said, it's almost like you grow these angel wings, right, that carry you to the next place. And I'm like, I can't believe we're talking about angel wings. But she said, problem is people think that they can go and get the angel wings first before they jump. You only get them once you jump. And that's something that I've taken on board. And I've learned over the years that the more often I jump, you know, I see that I do get carried. Like it's, it's, it builds a resilience and you're also drawn upon to, to, to bring about your, your best attributes when you do go and make that leap, that leap of faith into the unknown, into what might be a scary place. So over the years, not only have I sort of being able to morph with the technology and, and so I arrive at it without, you know, not being a newbie. But I also, I suppose, um, I've developed a certain, uh, well, I've, I've realised looking back that each time I do do it, I, I get rewarded, I get held by a community. Um, so that's what I would encourage 
in, in people is to actually take a leap. And even if it's just small leaps, you know, you might want to speak out about something on social media. You might just do a repost and say, I agree with this. Or you might put a comment on somebody else's um, feed. One of the best pieces of advice I can give to people is um, back you know, the, the brave ones. You know, I, I talk about choosing better leaders you know, in this one wild and precious life, like choose better profits, choose better profits. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be culling the voices in our feeds that are just destructive. And we need to not just follow these, you know, better profits. We also need to support them. So whether it's Greta Thunberg, whether it's me speaking out on something, hit the like, say I back you here, Sarah, because that is how movements happen not everybody has to be the person on the front line not everybody has to be the person in the arena but what we can do is back those who do make that ballsy move I think that's really good advice yeah and I I think people don't know how to lead online they may know how to lead in a room um, with a team but they don't know how to lead online and I think that's really excellent advice in terms of back the back the brave ones thank you for that that's um really 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 insightful you mentioned uh, this one wild and precious life, and I, um, I I do want to talk to you um, about the book. And I do have a confession to make, which is I may I know you're wow. anti- <laughs> but I an entire packet of post-it notes when I first read this book in 2020. So, um, but I do. There is a couple of quotes from this book, and I know um, it has just been released in the UK. So, um, and given where we, we are probably talking to a few viewers in the UK, um, this is a really excellent book that I would highly recommend um, that um, that you check out um, by Sarah, um, as well as your first book, First We Make the Beast Beautiful. But on the subject of wild and precious life, one wild and precious life, because that's also the um, the theme of your podcast as well. What I wanted to ask was um, really just share a quote, and I will bring it up on screen um, because I think it's I think it's telling really about perhaps the, the state of the world we're in, um, and I'd love for you to um, speak just a little bit more about this. Um, and it was actually a quote um, by George. I'm going to pronounce this. Is, is it Monbiot? Uh, yeah. Assuming it be French. Um, if you don't fit in, if you feel at odds with, with the world, if your identity is troubled and frayed if you feel lost and ashamed it be, could be because you have retained the human values you were supposed to have discarded you are a deviant and be proud I think this sums you mm. up very well Sarah and <laughs> you just said um mm. speak a little more on that the values that you were supposed to have discarded yeah I think so George, yeah. George writes for The Guardian and I really encourage everybody to follow his writing. He's getting quite old now, but he's been a big champion of, you know, in the environmental movement, but also community values, that kind of stuff. Um, and <clears throat> the, the values or the, the, the ideas that he's saying that you're meant to have discarded, they're the ones that um, we hold dear to us, that the, the neoliberal system has forced us to discard. So individualism runs rampant in our culture and we've we've come to accept it as just the way it is but individualism and I explain it this way and I explain it in the book this one wild and precious life like we don't have fangs we don't run particularly fast we don't have poison in our tail we've got very little that can actually keep us at the top of the food chain so what has kept us there it's this ability to coalesce around community and so our survival relies on our ability to find the sort of the sweet spot, the sweet spot, I should say, between individualism, i.e., making sure we feed ourselves first and maybe our immediate family, and attending to community. So basically being of service, giving up our own interests in the service of something bigger than ourselves. And Without that, we, we literally can't survive. So, you know, it's our ability to form groups, to communicate in tribes, and, and, and that's how we are able to keep um, alive and, and feed ourselves, that kind of thing. Individualism of the neoliberal system has actually got rid of all the structures that prioritise community. So whether it's scout movements, trade unions, church groups, and so on, what they all did was to ensure our selfish um, individualistic tendencies didn't run rampant. And the way I describe it in the book is that the moral umpires have been removed from the football field of life. And so we are now playing this game 
which has no rules, no umpires, and it really isn't a lot of fun. And that is the world that we live in today. So if you're feeling deeply uncomfortable about this and if you are still really trying to stick to the moral principles that ensure that the collective notion is preserved, then you can feel like you're quite insane. You know, you're going against the system that's telling us to just to go and buy more, look after yourself, you're worth it, um, all of that kind of thing. And um, so to go the opposite direction is to be deviant. And I say in the book, you know, it feels wonderful to say, I am deviant. I will not get sucked into this system. I will not be bought by these capitalist imperatives or the imperatives of what now are about 10 billionaires that control our lives lives, you know, Elon Musk um, et al. And so um, it takes bravery, but there's so many rewards when you actually put two fingers up to the system. And I remember, you know, only a couple of years ago when I used to talk this kind of language, people thought I was some kind of communist. They thought that I was, you know, kind of a little, a little cultish. Um, but I think people now understand that, you um, you know, we are, we are very much being sucked into the imperatives of a few, very, a very few number of people. And the values that we used to, um, well, that we hold so dear to ourselves have been, have been fragmented due to this community um, preservation being sort of forgotten about. I don't know if I've explained that particularly well, but um, yeah, I think that that's what George is referring to. And it's why I find that quote so wonderful. Mm, yeah, it is. It's really telling. Um, and I think this one more than precious life was, uh, for me personally, human connection has been a real, I, I guess, fascinating point of mine and a thread that runs through a lot of the work that I do. And I, I think you were the first person that really put our sort of almost lack of real connection um, together with our lack of connection to nature and ultimately the crisis that we're in and where, where we sit with that. And you talk, you talk a little bit in the book about moral loneliness. Mm. Um, I, can't, I do actually have a quote, um, which I don't mean to be using my, my quote too much. Once I worked out how to do this, I was like, oh, yeah, but, um, <laughs> but I think it's, I think mean, this is, this is um, one of your quotes from the book, which is moral loneliness is the supply cord to connection, um, caring, doing the right thing by each other and the, and the planet has been severed. So sorry, I didn't say that well. I should probably let people read. Um, when we can't tap into the point of life um, and to what matters, mm. when you don't know your true north, the disorientation is terrifying. You're suspended in a vague and directionless vastness. Could you talk a little bit about moral loneliness? Because I think mm. it's a or moral, moral aloneness versus moral loneliness um, and how that really fits with values. Yeah. So I think... Um, you know, we talk about this loneliness epidemic and when I looked into it and I knew it was tied up with why we were feeling so disconnected, you know. Um, and when I looked into it and drilled down, we really aren't um, lacking in connections with other people. Like we're more connected than ever before. What we're really feeling lonely from is not so much other people, but we're lonely from a meaningful connection with ourselves and a meaningful connection with I think, as I mentioned in that quote, the matrix of life, you know, um, and that includes the natural flow of life, the, the whole kind of congruence, you know, the patternings that bring us so much joy when we walk in nature and we see sunsets and we see animals behaving in certain ways. We feel so disconnected from that. And I, I use another term for it, which is acedia, which is a listful slothfulness um, which is, is that comes about from this moral aloneness. And Eric Fromm, the wonderful philosopher, he writes about this in such a wonderful way. But it is a term that has been used by the Greeks. It's been used by various religious thinkers throughout the ages. So there's been times in history when people have been aware of this moral aloneness. And, you know, I think, Again, it's the neoliberal system that has dragged us away from various structures, even just the idea of engaging in philosophical thought. Um, in Western countries like the UK, like Australia, like the US, um, there's this sort of almost anti-intellectualism that comes with the capitalist system. Um, 
you know, the distraction of phones and technology stops us from being able to even read long documents, which I write about in the book, you know. It drags us away from discerning reflective thought. Um, so a big part of my book is addressing that acedia, you know. And the acedia, of course, um, plays out as a I can't be bothered. I describe it as the sort of the overweight dude on the couch who's just like a piney on Twitter in one hand, ordering Uber Eats on the other, flicking between stations and basically not engaging in real life. You know, that's acedia. That's moral aloneness. And so a big part of my book, once I've identified that as the crux of the issue, is about reconnecting us back in with that, that kind of matrix um, and, and really connecting back into what are universal values. And those universal values are so often dictated by patterns in nature. You know, there's a truth that we can find in nature. We don't, we don't all have to be moral philosophers to, <clears throat> to navigate life. And David Brooks talks about this, that neoliberalism has put us in a position where we're expected to be moral philosophers because we don't have these moral guardrails, as he calls them. Um, you know, these are those umpires on the footy field of life that basically kind of tell us, you know, ah, you, that's not the right way to behave. No, nope, that's going to hurt other people. And when we don't have those, we kind of got to work it out for ourselves on top of feeding the kids and trying to keep a roof over our heads. It's a job that's too vast. This is why we have those moral guardrails and we have that moral discussion. We had moral leaders who would kind of keep us on the straight and narrow. Um, so, yeah, it's a big venture, but it's a really worthwhile one. And I talk about the moral wrestle. The moral wrestle is what we're here for. It is the funnest thing a human can do is to talk and engage in these things and really get a sense of what matters to you. I mean, it's the whole point. You know, Nietzsche said once we have a how, a why, we can handle any how, you know. Mm -hmm. Once we have an engagement with what matters to us, the rest we can handle. We can handle all kinds of hardship. Yeah, that's great. You've probably semi answer the next question I have, which is around, and given that perhaps, I think I know we're live on Facebook as well, but a lot of our viewers are um, on LinkedIn and it is a very business world. And I do know that um, you had recently talked about um, doing some speaking around um, running a business by values. Mm. I wanted to get your thoughts on what you would advise somebody who is either running an existing business or setting up a new business and they really want to keep it very values driven what would be your advice or what can you can you talk to that whole values yeah. in business piece yeah so i i do think that when a business operates on values the staff and customers you know clientele um really can smell it you know, and I, I operate with these different ways of describing how I sense things happening, you know, and I think smells are great. I've got a very strong sense of smell. I was born with a ridiculous sense of smell. It's how I ended up doing what I do today because I started out as a wine writer. I used to win, win these wine competitions um, because I could smell ridiculous things. And then I was a restaurant reviewer and, and my career grew from there. And that's also how I ended up on MasterChef is because of my interest in, in food and wine. Um, but, um, yeah, I do talk about this idea of sm being able to smell when, some, when an organisation or a brand or a company has been very, very authentic. And so, you know, getting your val values straight is so, so important. And I know there's big team meetings where they get out the whiteboard and they write it all down and, and so on. And I think that's super important, but it's really not going to count if it's all just paying lip service. Um, I think you've really got to go back to those things. Um, so I come, some of the values that I've operated by and they work and so it became quite addictive um, was this idea that I gleaned from the wonderful marketer Seth Godin and I'm sure many mm -hmm. people listening to this would be familiar with his work because he's rather prolific. Um, but I had interviewed him a number of times. I think the first time was, gosh, 13 years ago and you know, he talked about the idea of, you know, um, basically giving things for free. Um, so real artists just give, 
And this is this idea of you, you give it out into the world and then you build a tribe who will then support what you do next. So that's how I set up the I Quit Sugar business. I ran it for two years on my own on Facebook. I think about 3,000 people did the program and I was finessing it still. I was still refining the science on it and the recipes and that kind of thing. And I made not a cent. But when I learned how to do ebooks and I put together this kind of ridiculous ebook, it became an Amazon bestseller. I was expecting to sell 100. You know, I thought, oh, you know, people will support it. And if I can sell 100, I'll cover my costs. Anyway, it became this Amazon bestseller. And then it became a print book. And then people supported me further. So I built this tribe and, and um, based on values. And I really did believe that the information, the initial information should be free. So Everything I've ever done, I've had like 80% of the content being freely available. And then if you want to go the next step and want to get an extra layer of engagement or value, you then pay for it. And, and that's something that I've always felt is really important. And it's a big part why, of why I sold the business and gave everything away. So I gave everything away, not just the profits. I gave everything away when I did shut it down a couple of years ago. And it was because I was no longer giving out new information. And so it was also, it was just, it had become a business where it was about leveraging and making money from it. And um, that was not my, my thing. You know, I, I was more about giving out information that could help people. And then I found ways, and it was usually with the cookbooks, I would make money to keep myself going. Um, now, the wonderful thing is, and this is, you know, continuing on from that logic, i.e. working from values. When I did that, my career just went off into new levels of abundance. Um, and that's just how it works, right? Like the world wants to see values-driven behaviour. And when we do see it, it creates, you know, the, uh, Jonathan Haidt's done studies on this. When we see people behaving in an altruistic, altruistic way, it actually brings about this real sense of um, joy and, again, congruence and attunement, you know, with the, the matrix of life. And it actually sees us wanting to do the same thing. So there's this domino effect, but it also gives us this massive hit of happiness. Um, so there's a bunch of values like that that I do cover in my presentation. And I don't just cover them off as though they're Pollyanna-ish ways of being. I show the science um, behind it. Um, but, yeah, I guess that's how I've always operated. And it really is about sucking and seeing. You start out and you give it a go and then you get the feedback from the world. You know, they smell the authenticity of it and they want to be part of it. And I think mm. particularly at the moment, we are in a place of liminality, of in-betweenness, where we don't know what the hell's going on. The old way of running business, the old way of running life, the old way of doing the world, it's collapsing. It can't hold. You know, we are on the precipice of major economic and ecological collapse. And in fact, many people say it's already happening and it's going to you know, accelerate. We're looking at 2040. The Limits to Growth report is very much talking to that. Same with the various people working on planetary boundaries. And so a new world is going to have to be born and we have no idea what that's going to look like. So in this in-between time, if you can be a business, if you can be an operator, if you can be a service pro provider that stands sturdy in this in-between, in this kind of vortex you know um then i think you'll be in very good stead to be attracting a hell of a lot of people who are wanting certainty and look i always use the example of donald trump donald trump does well because he puts a stake in the ground now the stake is inherently corrupt and um and 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 actually have very has very little basis in truth but the sturdiness of what he does is what sees people flocking to him because people are wanting leaders who are sturdy. Now, if you can be values-driven and sturdy, then you're going to attract an incredible kind of uh, abundance, I think, especially in this in this in-between times. Mm. Oh, that's, that's really interesting and, and very good advice. There's something that you talk a lot in the book about hope, Sarah, and, um, you know, hope has always been something that you have spoken about and asked people about and I think written about. Um, but as one of your Substack subscribers um, yeah. who, who, who get the behind-the-scenes uh, things um, as a paying subscriber, um, I noticed that you've recently changed your tune and perhaps 
are talking more to the value of truth rather than hope. That's can you very true. <laughs> can, you t can you share a little bit about that and mm. really, um, yeah, and what, where that shift has come from and perhaps what the truth is? Yeah. Um, you're right. I very much wrote to this idea of hope and working to the Rebecca Solnit concept of hope, which um, a bunch of different philosophers but also climate activists and now business leaders refer to. And that's that idea that um, optimism is the same as pessimism. It's this idea that, well, somebody else is looking after it, I don't have to do anything. Pessimism is we're all doomed, I don't have to do anything. So optimism and pessimism operate in the same way. Hope, however, is optimism plus action. That's generally how Rebecca Solnit and a lot of climate activists have operated, that, um, you know, there's no point for being hopeful unless you're willing to roll up your sleeves and do something. So, and, and you don't genuinely feel hopeful unless you're engaged in some kind of activism or action. So, and there's a lot of science behind that in terms of the way brain circuitry works. However, more recently, as the climate scenario has worsened and as more information has come to light and as all the predictions have played out and I've dug into this further um, it's become quite apparent that um, hope is actually reasonably problematic at the moment um, from a psychological point of view because hope keeps us thinking that something great's going to happen and we've been in this hopeful state particularly people in the climate realm for some time now and when we hope for something and then it doesn't happen, a despair kicks in, a despair that is really, really devastating because if you've pegged everything on this hope and then it doesn't play out, it's, it's you know, it's a problem. Um, the other thing is that it's got to a point where hope is actually stopping us from facing the facts and the facts are not pretty and I know that this is probably not the forum to go into it too deeply but for those of you who are, might be interested in hearing more about you know where this space is heading um, you know as you mentioned I, I write about it on my Substack, and it's a discussion I'm having and I'm bringing the community along as I write about it in my next book so as you know I share chapters from my book and one of them was about truth. So I actually am looking into this. I'm talking to various psychologists about it. Um, pegging your sense of being, your values on truth is actually far more fruit fruitful because what's happened is we've got to a point where there's a dissonance between what we're thinking might happen or hoping will happen, i.e. technology will save us. Oh, if we, we just, we're going to switch to renewables pretty soon and it should be all right. We can just con continue as we've always been if we all get solar panels and switch to wind farms and, you know, the government, you know, they, they get their act together, et cetera. But we're starting to see stuff happening, you know, and it's not matching up. You know, our hope is not matching up with the facts. And when we have that kind of dissonance, Again, it leads to a profound despair, a profound confusion. And that's what I'm seeing among the people that I interact with and even just everyday people. Um, there is a despair that people can't quite put their finger on. And, I, and, it, and it really is this, this cognitive dissonance that we're all living to, that somehow we're going to be fine, but we also know the facts don't present that way. When we face the truth, we can actually live with where life is at and then we can start to build subsequent truths around that and we can build a community around it and then we can start working on ways to find compassion, peace and a settledness and acceptance of what's going on. And we can work what it does and I can speak from experience. It just dials up your adherence to values. You know, it gets you very, very real about how you want to be living this life. As I say, it's not the forum for me to get too doom and gloom about it. Um, the term for it is actually of what I'm talking about is called post-doom or post-tragic. Um, these are words that are starting to evolve. It's this idea of when you're in the tragicness, the despairingness, it's you basically have no philosophical or values-based uh, wisdom. When you move beyond that and you work in the realm of truth, you can then build up what's called the post-tragic kind of disposition. And, and there's a lot of joy to be found in that. Um, but, yeah, thanks for asking the question. I'm reticent to sort of go into it too much. 
Um, but for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about it, I am writing about it on my Substack. Yeah, and I would I would highly recommend that um, as a yeah as an insight I think to to that that subject and yeah mm-hmm. it's where well, I think you're right but so many people are hanging on to hope and perhaps perhaps if we were a little more truthful around um, not that not that we can't have hope but mm. there, perhaps if truth comes first for some people it will perhaps you know help help us shift into these. <clears throat> new systems and um, the, the new realms that we're, that we're entering. Yeah. Sarah, I could talk all day to you too about how you um, <laughs> yeah. um, awesome Me too. And those, um, those that are watching as well. Um, before we go, could you, how can people connect with you? Well, you've mentioned Substack. Um, mm. How else can people connect with your work? You obviously have the book um, and your podcast. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so my podcast is called Wild with Sarah Wilson and you can find it on any platform. Uh, Feel free to give it a rating. Um, I do talk about big topics, topics that, um, you know, and I interview people, amazing people from Margaret Atwood to, you know, some of the top philosophers and thinkers in the world. And I'm aware that they'll often only do two or three podcasts a year. So I'm very, very... um, flattered that they come and join me on my conversation however it is a it is a level of conversation that advertisers particularly in Australia find it hard to understand so at the moment I'm very much struggling to keep it going it costs me a bomb to run it it's a conversation that I think is important so if any of you out there have brands that are looking for for a a podcast partnership come and talk to me Um, the substack is sarahwilson.substack you can find it if you just type in the URL, um, and that's where I do most of my interaction, as you know, and I like I I I read every single comment. There are fifty thousand people who subscribe, but there's a smaller paid community that gets some access to these book things and other more intimate um, discussions. And yes, my book, this one wild and precious life, and that can be found pretty much anywhere. The cover in the UK, if anyone's listening, is orange. Have you? Oh, you've got. Not so that, that's the Australian, US, and mm-hmm. uh, Spanish version, um, and the UK one is reversed out. So it's got a beautiful orange cover. In case anyone gets confused, um, and it's available in all bookstores at the moment. I did wonder whether that had something to do with the fact that there was the UK release well, almost three years later, um, and then the sky had gotten orange. Whether that was a, <laughs> an ominous sign of where we were heading, perhaps, but yeah. that was truth in itself. Yeah, I didn't. I, that wasn't the purpose behind it, but I can see what you're thinking. Yeah. Yes. Well, Sarah, thank you very much. Um, for those that are watching, um, we had a couple of comments. Um, thank you, John and Lois. Um, and I, I think some of the Facebook comments haven't come through yet. But um, for those that are watching, thank you very much. Please do share this conversation. Um, please do connect um, with Sarah's work where you can. Um, in terms of the World Values Day Lives conversations, um, I've got a really nice follow-on from this one, which is Andrew Griffiths talking about sustainability um, with Planet Mark in the UK, and that is coming up on this same time on Monday. So please do join us for that. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. And please, um, please do connect um, where you can. I appreciate your time and all the work that you're doing, Sarah. Thank you.